Hi, it's, it's awesome to, to be here with you guys. Uh, my name is Daria. I'm the co-founder at Wonder Dogs. So let me tell you a little bit about us um, and kind of our relationship with Village Global, and then we can you know, jump straight in. So um, myself, I'm Daria, so I'm a former VC. Um, I was investing in early stage startups in Silicon Valley for a few years, and kind of the idea behind Wonder Dogs came out of this experience of you know witnessing amazing products um, and amazing companies kind of miss out on opportunities for you know investing and getting early following because they were struggling creating kind of you know the right narratives and the right visuals for their pitches and and beyond that as well. And Natalie uh, is our art director. She's going to be joining this conversation as well a little bit later. But you know uh, we started our work uh, with startups about four years ago. Um, over the last four years, we helped our startups raise over $200 million, both in terms of, you know, helping them with narrative and pitch decks and uh, pitch deck designs as well. Um, about a year ago, we started working with uh, Village Global startups. Uh, you know, we uh, worked with NVIDIA and Soulbox and, and a few other others. And, you know, recently uh, we just realized that, you know, we kind of are a pretty good fit as partners and uh, um, we decided to... Um, come up with a pitch deck design and narrative track for this vintage of Village Global Startups. And um, what it entails is essentially uh, we want to help you learn about building awesome pitch decks. Uh, we also will provide you uh, personalized you know, feedback. Um, I know that some of you already scheduled uh, a, a half hour meetings with me for the next week. So that will be that stage. Um, that feedback will help you enhance your deck. Uh, we also are going to talk today about um, all the tools that we created specifically for Village Global uh, Vintage in order to help you work with your decks with ease and you know make them look polished and professional. And then um, after you enhance your deck, uh, based on this feedback, uh, you know, ideally is that you reshare it with us, with my Wonder Dogs team. So we are a team of 20, um, out of which there's, you know, six designers and they all are really great at building and designing pitch decks. And uh, we will help you get your decks, uh, you know, to an awesome level, pretty much get it from 80% to 100% by, you know, uh, helping you with finishing design touches. And then at the end of it, we will present, um, kind of our designs of your deck back to you and help you understand how to, you know, keep iterating and innovating on those. Um, so today we are in the very first part of this track, which is a learn part. Um, and uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, some fundamental pitch deck fundamentals. So it's quite a unique um, piece of marketing and sales collateral. So it's important to understand what are its key differentiators before getting into building one. Um, we will also potentially, will help, with help of Sam as well, we'll run through the most crucial pitch deck slides, slide by slide, to show you you know, the um, key things uh, to note uh, when it comes down to uh, designing, you know, product slides and um, opportunity and TAM slides and so on and so forth, both from the narrative perspective and from the design perspective. Um, we will then uh, introduce you to the toolkit, so free high quality um, tools and materials that you can download to help you enhance your deck, um, built by our design team led by Natalie. Um, and then we will get into the quick overview of next steps, um, and uh, and that will be it for today. And obviously, um, should you have any questions, please uh, feel free to shoot them. We will keep uh, maybe 10 to 15 minutes at the very end uh, for, for all of your questions. Um, just a quick note, I am sharing my screen so I cannot see the chat window, so if everyone, anyone has it, then Sam, I'll, I'll defer to you to uh, note those questions and, and help you with the answers. Um, so starting with pitch deck fundamentals, um, so part two, part one. Basically, what makes pitch decks so unique? Um, and I remember, you know, when I used to be a VC, um, every day I would probably go through about 20 to 25 different pitch decks. Um, and uh, you don't really have a lot of time um, as, a, as a venture investor to um, read through every single deck. What you're looking there is for a hook 
to kind of get you involved in this and get you excited about this. And I remember, you know, it always would get me quite frustrated seeing that folks are not telling me what they actually are doing until slide 10. You know, I would get really, really annoyed by this and I would probably decide to pass on it. Um, you know, uh, and then the other one is uh, founders often underestimate how much of a value pitch deck is as a sales and marketing collateral. So think about it if, you know, you can raise about million or million and a half in early stage capital through your deck, then technically a 15 slide deck is worth 100K per slide. Um, you know, yet oftentimes, you know, being busy and, and having other founder jobs to be doing, uh, folks are really underestimate how important it is it to dedicate a lot of time to crafting your deck. Um, the third point that makes pitch decks quite a unique uh, asset is that it's way more than data. Um, and oftentimes it's finding the right balance between data and interpreting it in the way that feels relatable and emotional to the investors, even though they are looking at it as from a business standpoint, they're still people and they want to be to feel related to your product. Um, and then lastly, it's fine mar margins. Basically, it's hard. It's not easy to differentiate your deck because you have to be following a certain structure that the VCs are used to. And we'll talk about the structure later on. But at the same time, you have to find ways to let your idea shine through the way you talk about it, the information you present, and the way you end up designing it. Um, and uh, just a quick note, this deck is, uh, uh, is meant for you to read through it. So there is, there's more uh, content and more text here that I'm talking about. Uh, but um, after this presentation, you will all receive access to this deck so that you can go through it um, and, and you know, uh, pick your highlights. Um, but when it comes to narrative fundamentals, and I feel like um, that's kind of like the, uh, we base this on the most commonly used mistakes um, of our founders. So um, one of the important points is to use inductive reasoning in pitch decks, which means you say, you know, a conclusion, and then you show why you're right by uh, giving the investors more points. That again, kind of comes back to, you know, talking about your product on slide two or three, as opposed to slide 10 or 11. And, uh, you know, The Pyramid Principle is a great book that Barbara Minto wrote that I, you know, suggest if you have some time to read all of it, it's about writing clearly, it's about writing pitches as well. So she's saying that deductive arguments are boring because they make a mystery story out of what should be a straightforward point. So being to the point is, you know, one of the crucial fundamentals for a pitch deck narrative. Um, and that kind of uh, leads into leading with your investment thesis. So remember what you're pitching. If you're seed pre-revenue, oftentimes it's about pitching a concept. What are the best tricks and tips to be, to be pitching a concept, you know, using analogies to help investors understand your thinking and so on. If you're post revenue, you're pitching a, a real company. So how do you use the data? How you display the data um, would be kind of one of your crucial points. And of course, being very focused and not kind of uh, trying to be all over the place when it comes to the future of your company, the future of your idea is quite crucial as well, because, you know, what investors are looking for oftentimes is your ability to focus as, as a founder, foc identify what matters and focus on that most. And lastly, be relatable. Uh, which is something that, you know, I mentioned in a past slide. Um, again, oftentimes incredible startups are kind of missing out on the opportunity to connect with the investors, not only from the logical and reasonable standpoint, but also from the emotional standpoint. So um, feel free to dive in um, some of the links we provided here later uh, if you're interested. They have some great, um, more in-depth insights um, about it. And so, you know, kind of these fundamentals uh, flow into the key narrative pitfalls that uh, we've been kind of witnessing in the last four years uh, with our clients and how they come up with their decks and deck, deck narratives. And I feel like especially this is a problem for, you know, uh, uh, kind of life sciences, more academia type of startups is um, writing very, in a very complex way. You know, we all love to say that investors don't necessarily need to be have a PhD in your industry. Um, they are just very smart people who can, you know, uh, understand a lot of things. But at the same time, you have to write simply because um, being kind of long-witted and complex also makes investors feel like you 
are trying to hide a lack of idea behind uh, you know the complexity um and again like hyperbole so um making things feel more important and bigger and larger than they are when it comes to the problem you're solving or you know the future of your company is also something that i feel like it's very like 2000s so the complete making world a bigger a better place is is a, is a bit of an outdated uh, notion by now and being very bluntly honest about the problem you're solving and the value you're creating is more important than trying to kind of you know uh blow it out of proportion and then trying to uh not use too much of an industry jargon uh i feel like that jargon words and um are the most overly used when it comes to the decks and oftentimes they just kind of make the the reader if he's not from your industry pause and have to look it up and it just kind of breaks the entire narrative flow so thinking about explaining complex notions and complex technologies through simple words um straight narratives um is something to always look out for uh, when you write a deck and lastly you know but not least design is your alley so very often times, you know, design is the last thing everyone thinks when it comes to pitch decks, but it can, when done right, it can really amplify your message. It can make the investors remember you. And it can also make sure that when investors look back on your website, your deck and the website are aligned and you kind of create this first uh, attempt of a unified experience for for your investors um, when, when it comes to your brand. And then um, obviously, good design helps you look professional and not sloppy which oftentimes is crucial for the startups who are battling that lack of trustworthiness that typically um investors have in them um and just to kind of give you a funny story regarding the importance of design uh this was um symbol ai our client from last year who uh pretty much raised additional eight hundred thousand eight hundred thousand dollars because the investor really liked <laughs> the pitch deck design and the website design um so not you know uh even though sometimes design feels like a quite a high level and and kind of a fluffy thing to add it actually does bring quite tangible um results um Serby, by the way is an amazing founder you should talk to her um moving into slide by slide examples so pretty much going from okay like this is the prism of uh, how we should be looking at the pitch deck's narrative and the pitch deck design um, to kind of some some of the more concrete uh, points here that we're trying to make. So uh, I'm going to walk you guys through kind of like the nine key, uh, you know, pitch slides that I think every pitch deck always has. So title, problem, solution, product, market and opportunity, competitive landscape, traction, financials and team. Um, so I'm going to walk you through those and show you kind of some of the examples of before and after um, how the slide was uh, narrated and designed before and, and what can be done to enhance it so that you can see how much more uh, influence and impact you can have on your investor uh, if you do things um, in a thoughtful way and approach it as a, you know, as a sales presentation. Um, and then we will we also have a few bullet points on just kind of key takeaways to remember about each slide. So we'll start with the cover slide. And the example here is Invita Biosciences. So that's the company that we worked with that's part of uh, Village Global as well. Um, they recently closed their $51 million Series A round. Um, and uh, basically, you know, they already had branding that we've created before and we were designing you know the this the kind of the the whole presentation for them. So uh, starting using them as an example for the cover slide. Cover slide is a great way to introduce your company. Um, don't forget to include, you know, kind of the most basic things from the narrative standpoint. You know, the name should be clear. The motto or one liner should be there. Uh, there should be a contact information so that investors immediately know how to get back in touch with you. Um, if you have certain, you know, visuals or anything that can help you strengthen your brand and make it memorable, it should go right on the cover slide. And then from the design standpoint, uh, it also cover slide is like a guiding principle in case you want to include any break slides further down the line, they all should be kind of in the same style so that you are creating this unified experience throughout the deck. Um, and uh, here you can see it a little uh, larger in size. 
So here, you know, you can see that their visuals were quite unique, uh, which gave us a great opportunity to, to make sure that the deck is very memorable and their break slides are repeating the same visual elements and styles that, you know, we used in the cover slide. Uh, moving to the problem slide. So obviously it's the problem you're solving and why. Um, the, a few of the key narrative standpoints here is think big. Um, one day your, pro your, your, your product might actually solve the largest problem. So sell the vision and sell your points uh, and your milestones getting to that vision. Um, and avoid wordiness. You know, problems oftentimes feel like they are very complicated. Try to do your best to break it down into simple, you know, paragraphs or, or sentences in order for people to understand uh, the problem and its gravity, even if they're not coming from from your industry. Um, so, and of course, uh, in terms of design and visual perspective, uh, visualize everything all the time. Try to, if you can, substitute a word with an image. Do that. Um, use color to show how important or grave is the problem. And then um, kind of coming back to avoiding wordiness, make sure that, you know, there is enough space and you're not distracting um, everyone from, you know, the keywords and the key problems. And the a good example is here uh, from a company called Electrify. They were just sold, um, I forgot to whom, but um, this was their uh, Series A deck that we helped them put together. So the top uh, option is essentially their original problem slide. And as you can see here, you know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of chaos in it, basically, and a lot of things that you just kind of don't understand without uh, an overview. And what we've done with it, we made sure that the challenge is actually front and center and that um, it's not only not chaotic, but also has an educational element to it, um, teaching the, the viewer of how the oils will transition into um, electrons, uh, which, you know, Electrify can help with. Um, once again, you will get access to this deck so you can kind of see in more detail of how we you know, kind of went about enhancing it. Um, problem leads to solution slide. And oftentimes these slides are kind of like mirroring each other, right? So um, if you have a chance, you can even use the same layout for solution slides, but kind of flip it um, so that it looks like a, like a brother of the problem slide. Um, that's a high level overview of your solution. That's kind of the continuation of your vision. Um, and uh, basically the important part from the narrative standpoint here is to um, distill key components out from your product slide to show how it will end up kind of feeding into the product. Um, and from the design narrative, you know, design standpoint, uh, you know, you can take the problem slide and apply different colors, like more positive colors to it, uh, but keep some of the visual layout elements in there. Um, and uh, as usual, visualize what's possible to visualize and use a lot of uh, space because when it's very cluttered, it's really hard to understand and read through the slide. Um, that's again, Electrify, the same company. So again, like they kind of have these obscure visuals that are hard to understand without a voiceover uh, when you you know uh, come to their original um, slide and then that's what we've done we kind of as you can see here we kind of highlighted the key components of their solution so that they really stand out um, and divided everything in very clear layout so that you understand you know that first i read the top here then go to the right and then go to the bottom um, kind of moving on quickly, uh, the product slide. So that's essentially presenting what you are actually planning to do uh, and how your solution comes to life. Um, so from the narrative standpoint, it's very important to make sure that uh, it feels real, um, that it feels, you know, uh, tangible, that it doesn't feel like it's something you did on a napkin. Um, and design can really help amplify this, right? So. Um, if you have any product shots or even mockups that look realistic, include them. If you place them inside of a laptop mockup, it will help it look more coming to life, more put together. Um, you know, um, when you uh, try to kind of add importance to, you know, the features and differentiators, you can highlight right away. Um, and again, like more visuals, less text, 
even if, uh, especially if this deck has a voiceover from your end, um, you don't want people to be, you know, just reading your slides while you're trying to talk to them and make the connection. Um, this is an example of two product slides that um, one of our long-term clients uh, create, we created for, for them for their serious seed. Um, and, you know, it's a software product. So <clears throat> we use laptop screens um, and kind of like highlighted the key uh, feed features that they wanted. And the same goes here. So um, try to put product front and center, make it sleek um, and highlight only what matters. Um, moving on to the market side, so showing the size of the market and the size of the opportunity you can tap. Um, so um, if from the narrative standpoint, don't forget that there are several ways you can do, uh, you know, evaluation of this. So, um, and this is something that Sam added here, but obviously you guys all know it, you're, you're doing it right now. So top down, bottom up, like pick your lane and, and go with this. Um, in terms of design, um, obviously, Market slide is one of the more complex slides. Visual, visualization matters a ton here. Um, and like you can see it on this example. So that's EverID. They're now called Everest. They're a prominent cryptocurrency company right now. But when we started working with them about three or four years ago, that's how their market slide looked. And it's like a lot of information. And it's really hard to understand how, how much is 2.6 billion and what is related what is related to what and what should I be looking at? Um, and so what we did here essentially is we only picked the most important pieces um, of their of their deck and um, used a, you know these kind of figurines to show and help them show exactly in relation to one another uh, what are the numbers of users that they can tackle um, and only pick the most important pieces from the market sizing slide um, as they had. And so, basically um, breaking down complex numbers and graphs into s simple you know, visuals is important and using comparisons can really help you get people to immediately see the value you can be creating. Um, that's another way of displaying an opportunity slide. If you know, sometimes it's not about uh, the number of users, sometimes it's the number of locations, but again, Try to keep consistency in terms of visuals. This is NVIDIA, um, the, the biotech startup I was talking about. Um, and always remember to visualize very brightly the most important takeaways that the investor has to get out of this slide. So uh, we did it kind of uh, here on the bottom. Um, don't be afraid to tell them what they're supposed to be thinking about things. Um, Moving al almost finishing up with the with the slide by slide examples, um, competition. So being very honest about your competition existing and uh, what they're currently better than you at, and what you can you know what what type of pie you can uh, take away from them is very important. So balancing honesty about the market and clarity, plus adding the confidence that you know, despite the existence of the competition, you will, you know, make it um, is very important. Um, no one trusts a person who thinks that they have a blue ocean because they rarely exist. Um, and then from the design standpoint, um, I would say the best solution for the competition is typically a simple table, uh, like a feature table, as you can see down here from, uh, again, EverID, now Everest. Uh, but sometimes, you know, um, the comparisons tend to be more complex. So a graph like you see here for near space labs um, can be very useful when we manage to not only show that near space labs is best in terms of, you know, two of the key features, but also show that it's the lowest quality, which we kind of added this color coding here. So try to be creative, but still think about how to make these comparisons as simple and as straightforward as possible. Um, so as you can see here, I love tables. <laughs> um, almost wrapping up here. So team slide. Uh, this is quite straightforward, I think. Um, investors will always be investing in your team. Think about the best ways to display your team achievements. Maybe it's per person. Maybe it's joint team achievements, as you can see here down down in the bottom. Uh, um, if you know if there is a gap, as as we talked about it before, if there is a gap in an early team leave a photo blank presented as a career opportunity, you know, and very likely investors might actually know someone who would be a perfect addition to your team as well. So that will help you 
create additional um, relationships with your potential investors. Um, and oftentimes, you know, uh, I really like this uh, near space labs uh, team design, a uh, team slide design, because instead of, you know, trying to put forward every single member and making slide very text heavy, we decided to pick only the most highlights of uh, the team's kind of mutual achievements and place very memorable logos um, in their mutual experience, which kind of immediately creates this focal point of like, okay, yeah, I know I can trust those guys with you know what they're taking up on. Um, traction and roadmap slide are one of the most complex ones, just because you have to place uh, all, oftentimes a ton of information into one slide and make it very readable. So in terms of a narrative, um, only share it if there's real milestones that you know you will meet that will make investors excited. Um, then um, basically make sure that um, you know who you're pitching to. So if you're pitching to the investors, uh, make sure that you're using the roadmap that will talk about how you will be using their capital um, through the milestone, milestones you will be achieving. If it's a sales deck, um, also you can use it to show what other features you can be adding and, and what customers you will be adding further down the line. Um, and please don't try to spe speculate uh, about the future just because again, a lot of things are unknown, but um, that coming, kind of uh, coming back to my point about hyper hyperbole and creating uh, stuff, trying to make stuff seem better and bigger than it is, um, it's, you know, investors will, will see right through it. Um, and so in terms of design, you know, try to amplify your roadmap by making sure that it's, you know, as clear and as simple as possible, but also potentially has some visual uh, kind of trick to it. Like, for example, here, as we're showing, you know, the company will grow within the year and will kind of find itself on a higher um, on a higher level, right, than before. Or this uh, roadmap, if we just had like a lot of text. And so what we decided to do is to just place it in several lines, but make it kind of like a, a consistent line for them as opposed to just, you know, a straight one or, or a table. Uh, and the very last slide here uh, for financials and ask, and again, like I know that I'm going through this quite uh, briskly, but you guys will have access to all of this information after this call. Um, so for the narrative standpoint, um, you have to end every meeting of yours with investors with a few clear asks. Um, you have to be extremely clear about how you will be using your funds that's you know the investors give you their money so uh, they will place a lot of importance on this um you at the same time you're not really you don't really owe them to be naming the round size so think about this as your business decision rather than like a narrative decision or something you have to do um and of course don't forget to remind them about your contact and how to put it, put it put in touch with you just because again this is a sales document you want them to get back to you um and in terms of the you know kind of like design side of, of things i think the key part of the financial side is making sure that your graphs look consistent with the rest of your deck because most of the times what we see is folks placing these like excel um uh, you know like on enhanced excel graphs right there and it kind of breaks the entire deck it starts looking sloppy uh if you use like different fonts and different uh you know colors so make sure that it uses the same fonts the colors are contrasting if it's a pie um, and make sure that it's just kind of simple and on brand with the rest of your deck. Um, so these are a few examples. Um, and um, moving on to design toolkit. Um, and I know, again, I'm going quite quickly right here. So if you have any questions, please uh, shoot them uh, in the chat window or afterwards. But um, kind of uh, going back to what we were talking about, about our track. So I hope that um, what you know you've learned so far and what you will be rereading later down the line uh, is going to be helpful for you to think about how to potentially enhance your current deck or write a new deck um, and uh, what we decided to do and that would be uh, you know our next step would be for me to 
uh, give some like all of the teams that schedule a call with me individual feedback so that we know what are the areas uh, opportunity areas to kind of uh, help you enhance uh, your investor decks. Um, but in the meantime, we you know I asked my design team to prepare um, ready to use simple, super easily customizable visual materials uh, and assemble kind of like a design toolkit for you to, you know, if you're starting a deck from scratch, if you want to enhance your deck, if you want to be using this for your future decks as well. Uh, we just figured out that um, oftentimes there's just a few key ground rules and a few good selection of, you know, imagery and colors that can make uh, the whole, you know, deck experience. So this toolkit is assembled with the idea for you to go back to it whenever you need and uh, select, you know, beautiful pictures, fonts, colors, and so on and so forth, templates for the decks as well. Um, and, you know, be able to create something alone um, that, you know, would look like a designer kind of designed it. Um, there's still a huge gap between a professional team designing something and you know you do it, you kind of DIYing it but we are pretty sure that by using this toolkit it will definitely look quite polished and it will you know create this kind of unified experience for your users um, so after I give you the feedback uh, individual feedback feel free to use this design toolkit and then um, you know uh, we'll take it from there and we'll help you get the decks to the best of them. Uh, but I wanted to give Natalie a few minutes to be able to talk about uh, this design toolkit and show you exactly how it works. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and I'm going to allow Natalie to join in. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Daria. And um, yeah, I'm going to take you through uh, what Design Toolkit is and how we structured it and essentially uh, what kind of materials and tips it has to help you structure your design work, design process on your deck. Um, so our design toolkit is divided into three parts and also has an introductory document. So the first one is about defining your playground. So this is something that we call the basics of your identity, of your style or whatever you call it. Um, and that's essentially fonts and colors for your startup. Um, the second stage is about enriching your deck with the right visuals. And uh, when we say key visuals, we mean um, imagery, um, icons, um, any visualizations, any infographics, illustrations, and graphs. So that would be stage two. Um, and we also have stage three, which is about um, selecting and populating the right uh, template for your deck that can actually uh, be very effective to kind of streamline your entire work. So what unites all the guidelines um, for all the three stages um, is firstly that um, all of them have some examples of goes and no goes um, on how to select and how to uh, behave in that design space of your deck. Um, second of all, and you know, the most exciting part about those guidelines is that um, all of the three contain our unique selections of materials that you'll be able to use for free. Um, and all of those materials are kind of categorized um, in between different industries. So we have enterprise, finance, consumer, um, tech, deep tech, and life sciences. Um, so you'll be able to kind of, you know, choose um, the folder and choose the right, basically the right material from uh, the folder. And we really hope that, you know, you will find something useful there Then you can then uh, populate and use in the future. So um, I'm going to quickly guide you through every stage in more detail. So stage one, the basics. Um, we have typography and color. So um, typography is something that might seem very small when it comes to the identity image as a whole. Um, in fact, it's not exactly true. So typography is a very complex discipline and you know some designers dedicate a lot of time to it, sometimes the entire career. Um, the main thing about the fonts is that that's a visual representation of your startup voice. Um, and sometimes um, the wrong typography and font pairing choices can lead to a misunderstanding uh, of what you're talking about by your investors. Imagine 
um, you're a biotech company and you're using something um, like Comic Sans that is, you know, entirely from a different plate. Uh, so that can actually have a very uh, damaging effect to the entire presentation. Um, and what unites typography and colors is that uh, the right selection of them can actually bring a lot of memorability to your deck and make it unique and, you know, make it um, have um, some character uh, and um, diversify it from the rest. So when it comes to color, um, it's something more obvious um, when we think about it as a part of the identity. Um, so uh, with the colors, it can be quite tricky and overwhelming to select um, the colors and especially the pairing. So in the guidelines, um, we've provided a set of tools and resources where you can go um, and kind of, you know, automatically get the contrasted palette that you can use across all your applications. Um, so the problem that, um, you know, you can face with colors is uh, we kind of have two extremes here, right? We can have them. So um, the first extreme is that we can have too much color going on um, and, you know, too much stuff um, in general. So that can create a very overwhelming effect on our, on our audience. Um, and, um, you know, our content and our main information and data can actually get lost uh, behind uh, that colorful noise. Uh, so that's something, you know, um, on one side. On the other side, we can have uh, everything very muted. Um, that normally happens, you know, when we're a little bit afraid of using the color and experiment with them. So the downside of that extreme is that um, we, um, we risk getting lost um, and we risk, you know, uh, being not memorable enough. So, um, yeah, so all of that um, can actually make our decks, um, uh, you know, that, you know, those selection can kind of kickstart your design process. And um, now that we're selected the colors and the typography for the deck, uh, we can proceed to, you know, to selecting the imagery. Um, and key visuals. So the key visuals can be divided into three groups. So the first one, um, which is photography, um, it's kind of like a main tool uh, for adding emotion to your message. Sometimes not just emotion, but also clarity um, and simplicity. Um, so it can be any photography uh, depending on the specifications of your project. So that can be product imagery, customer and team profiles, target audience, or it can be just striking uh, abstract visuals that can be used um, for such purposes as, uh, you know, enhancing presentation break slides um, or kind of um, bringing, you know, more emotion to uh, text heavy slides uh, that don't really have, you know, too much graphic stuff going on. The second uh, bit is iconography. So um, icons are normally needed when we have, again, text heavy slides and when uh, we're a bit tired of using bullet points and we want um, you know, to have some diversity in our deck. Um, so we always recommend choosing the icons that fit with stage one findings and selections, which are our fonts and colors. Um, and uh, we also have the third part of the key visuals uh, which is our graphs and data. So, you know, that's something very important um, in a deck. And, um, you know, using and like stylizing the graphs is important for um, a couple of reasons. So one of those reasons is actually when you add more, more color and when you add uh, more um, style diversity, to the graph, it actually makes it much easier for the users and the viewers to understand what's going on and to differentiate those uh, data units in between each other. Um, and the second most uh, important reason is that, um, like Daria said before, so the graphs is still a part of our deck. So they still should be stylized and they should fit in um, the, you know, the entire picture. So what often happens, um, we might spend a lot of time on, you know, on selecting the data and presenting the data, and we might have a uh, beautifully um, structured graph with a lot of very important insights. 
um, but we might lose the design. So it might be poorly designed. And in that case, we're actually risking, you know, on losing that value um, in the graph. So um, yeah, the design of the graph can create like a very uh, professional look and feel overall. So um, that was stage two. And now that we have the basics and now that we selected our visuals, we can then actually, you know, uh, bring them to life. Um, and we can do that um, in two ways. We can either create a presentation from scratch or we can use a template. Um, now um, let's break the stigma around using templates a little bit. So some people are afraid of doing that because um, you know, using a template means that um, generic or you know basic or everything will look alike, like you know everyone else. So the trick there is to take the template and then customize it because you know a customized template is kind of not a template anymore. Um, it's your unique production, your unique deck. Um, so um, in those guidelines, we have an entire section dedicated to uh, template selection. So we have um, those template selections uh, selections according to um, those five industry categories that I voiced over before. And we also have a bunch of very useful tips and rules on how to set up the master slide, on how to set up the composition, um, on how to upload your colors, and many, many other you know, uh, tips on customizing and using those templates. Um, so I'm going to quickly uh, jump to the folder to kind of show you how all that looks like. So um, you will have um, this folder. It has a brief introduction. So uh, this document kind of guides you through everything that we talked about in the presentation. And then we have stage one, stage two, and stage three. So if we go to stage one, for example, uh, we'll have the guide for stage one. Um, and then we'll have all those rules and all those uh, tips on typography, some goes and no goes. Um, and then we have the actual font pairing selections that you can use. Now, here you can see the breakdown be uh, between the um, industries. So, for example, you know that you want selection A from enterprise. So you go to font pairings, um, you go to enterprise, and here is your selection A. So all you have to do from here is to download those fonts. They come as zip files. You need to extract them to the folder and install um, in your system. So um, that's very important because as soon as those fonts are installed, you then can use them in pretty much any uh, software that you need. Um, stage two, I'm not going to really show in details because it's pretty much repeating the structure of stage one. Uh, what I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is stage Three. So the templates, uh, here you can see um, that it starts with the selection of templates. Um, some of those templates are, most of those templates are Microsoft Office templates. We also have um, a few Keynote templates. Most of the Microsoft Office ones can be also used in um, Google Slides. So they're pretty much set up in a similar way. Um, now we have some tips and rules on how to size, format, how to set up the master slides, how to set up the navigation, how to customize the colors, and how to customize the fonts as well. Um, here we have a uh, pretty thorough explanation of what a master slide is and why we really recommend using it and setting it up and spending time on it. So they can be pretty boring, but um, you know, you'll find all the explanation and information in the guidelines. Um, and here we also have you know, different guidelines for PowerPoint, um, Keynote, and Google Slides. But honestly, in between those three, we would really recommend using Microsoft Office, uh, just because it has the largest functionality um, and kind of uh, the most space uh, to customize and experiment with different things. Um, then we have kind of basic rules for composition for those who want to really dive in there. Um, and some goes and no goes example for uh, the compositions and some um, rules of text paragraphs. Now, this is how we do it. I'm going to go back um, and pass it on to Dara to um, guide us through the next steps. Thank you.
Thanks, Natalie. Um, yeah, guys, so that's kind of a, a brief overview that we're trying to, you know, squeeze into like a 50 minute quick lecture um, and show you, you know, uh, a few parts of the design toolkit that can really help you. But so when we were kind of strategizing about this track uh, with Village Global team, uh, we thought that, you know, the main goal for it would be to help you learn a little bit more about uh, assembling both pitch deck narrative and design to help you give, you know, get uh, feedback to your existing decks to uh, help you and give you tools to be able to enhance it and DIY a deck that will look really professional. And then lastly, to help you kind of bring your, your decks to, you know, to this kind of final Polish professional look by utilizing uh, a few hours of our design team on each of y'all's decks. And so uh, in order to achieve this, basically we are through the learning part or through the lecture part. And the next steps for us is to schedule a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one meeting via Calendly for both narrative and design feedback. That would be with me. Um, I, I think I've seen and done over 2000 decks maybe in my lifetime. So um, I, I'm excited to see Yol's um, decks as well. Um, I know that you have link and access to this information uh, on, you know, it's next Tuesday and Wednesday. So if you haven't done so and, and wish to get feedback uh, from my end, feel free to, to schedule. There's uh, still a few slots left. Um, then, <coughs> excuse me, the ideal um, kind of uh, next step is for you to incorporate that kind of custom unique feedback that I'll give you uh, and you agree with um, to enhance your deck um, when, you know, where it makes sense while, while using the design toolkit um, that you will have access to. And then, um, so ideally for, for us, and I know I think Jake was asking this in the Q&A, um, is to submit drafts to our team by one of these core dates. So September 29th, October 6th or October 13th. And uh, that submitting it by that core date will pretty much guarantee you that we will revert the enhanced deck from our design team to you within the next week after this after this date. Um, the way we will do it, we, you know, uh, we always have a strategist that works on the deck, even if, when it's just the deck design and a designer, a lead designer. And so uh, when you send us your enhanced decks, we will um, use our strategy team to uh, give designers the right brief on how to enhance the decks. And then the designers will you know, proceed with doing so. And then after we're done, we will reach out to you individually and schedule a follow-up call for half an hour so we can present you your enhanced deck and while presenting, explain, you know, the design choices we've made, how we enhanced it and how you can actually use it in the future or reuse it or alter it if you if you need. Um, so basically the key dates for now is next Tuesday and Wednesday. After that, it would be September 29th, October 6th or October 13th. And after that, after that it's pretty much within one, one week um, or so is, is the next time we'll, we'll get back to you. Um, I think I'm done. Um, I think this is it for for now. Uh, thank you very much, Village Global, for having us, and and thank you guys for for coming to this um, this morning uh, presentation. Uh, and yeah, uh, I think we have uh, about seven to five minutes uh, left, so uh, I'm happy to to answer. If there's any other questions, let me stop sharing my screen for a second, and I'm back. Awesome. Thank you so much, Daria. This is amazing. Um, the amount of knowledge that you and Natalie dropped is honestly just incredible. Uh, and we've seen, awesome. you know, hundreds of companies go out and fundraise. And I think that, um, you know, the, the the resources that you provided and the knowledge that you have is is, you know, some among some of the best that we've seen. And so I hope a lot of people took a lot out of this session. And thank you for your time. Um, we have some questions, so like from Norm and Jake. And so if people do have questions afterwards, we'll be following up with access to the toolkit. Um, Daria, are we going to be able to share the slides from this com this with everybody? Yes. Uh, yes. Amazing. So we basically we will share with you guys the folder uh, that Natalie was just sharing, uh, just screen sharing. So you will have the access to this deck, which is in the core of the folder. And then there's you know, the folder for the design toolkit with all of the materials in there. And uh, they will be accessible to all the Village Global Vintage participants. Awesome. So it's the link. Just go click on the link. <laughs> Great. 
And then, uh, yeah, if you want to sign up with the Calendly, it's in the chat. You can also find it in the handbook. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to myself and I can loop in uh, Dario and we can make sure that everybody's covered and gets the support that they need. Um, cool. Awesome. And with that, I think um, we can end. Thank you so much, Dario, for joining. Thank you, everybody else Thank for you. attending. And we'll give you a few minutes of your time back.